Welcome to the Global Migration Center lecture series. This is a recording of the online Global Migration and IOM Migration Research Division webinar entitled Afghanistan, Displacement and Migration. What do recent events mean for future dynamics in the region? The speakers are Professor Jalal Abbasi Chavez, Dr. Marie McAuliff, Dr. Nassim Majidi, Professor Alessandro Monsuti. The event is moderated by Professor Vincent Chetay. For more information, check out our website on graduateinstitute.ch slash GMC or connect with us on Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. Webinar today will uh, 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 focus on uh, the situation in Afghanistan uh, and uh, with uh, 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 an additional focus on migration and, uh, and displacement. So, in short, what do recent uh, events mean for future dynamics in the region and in uh, Afghanistan in particular? Uh, clearly, uh, 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 the collapse of the Afghan government has brought into sharp focus uh, fragility uh, of uh, Afghanistan from uh, many different fronts, political, security, economic, and, and so on. And clearly, the economic conditions, security, volatility, but also uh, human rights abuses uh, of the Taliban regime create uh, uh, the perfect uh, situation uh, to, for a major, for a new crisis uh, in terms of uh, displacement. Uh, however, on the other hand, uh, uh, mass hysteria is already uh, taking over migration in the sense that uh, haunted by the so-called migration crisis of 2015, European leaders, politicians are already preparing to stop Afghan refugees even before the later have actually left their, their country. So uh, all uh, the, the rhetoric surrounding the situation in Afghanistan so lacks rationality and calls for a more nuanced uh, narrative. And I'm very pleased today to have with us uh, uh, well-known uh, uh, experts on uh, Afghan uh, migration, and they will critically uh, uh, assess the events uh, uh, in Afghanistan and explore the implication for migration and displacement in the region and uh, beyond the, the region. Um, we'll act as a moderator. I'm Vincent Chetai, Professor of International Law at the Graduate Institute and uh, uh, Director of the Global Migration Center. I will now uh, continue uh, and, and give the floor to uh, Professor Jalal Abbasi Chabazi, uh, a major expert uh, in this region, a professor in uh, uh, demography at the University of Tehran. Please, uh, Jalal, the floor is yours. Good afternoon and good evening to all um, dear colleagues and participants. Uh, and it's a great pleasure for me to join the panelists uh, on this uh, important and timely webinar on Afghanistan displacement and migration. Um, in this uh, uh, brief presentation, um, I'll be talking about the um, uh, large uh, waves of Afghan uh, migrants to Iran um, and the situation that they have uh, been experiencing uh, since um, their arrival and also during uh, different uh, periods. And I end my discussion with the recent uh, um, changes in Afghanistan and implications for uh, migration uh, not only for Iran and Afghanistan, but for the neighboring countries and EU. Before I make my presentation, let me go through these uh, take-home messages. First, um, Iran has been host to three million Afghan refugees and migrants over the last four decades. Uh, over one million Afghans in Iran are undocumented, uh, with majority being in construction industry and farming with temporary war conditions. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic um, has affected the lives of Afghans in Iran and Afghanistan, uh, particularly due to the uncertain economic conditions. 
uh, the recent uh, political changes in Afghanistan has led to the fifth wave consisting of both uh, legal and irregular or uh, illegal migrants uh, coming to Iran, although this wave is not large. And thus, there is a need for international coordination of support for Afghanistan and the neighboring uh, host countries. This is the message that I wanted to convey of this presentation. Uh, we have been experiencing large waves of Afghans coming to Iran uh, before 1970s, the first wave came. Then during the 90s, nine, during the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, and now we are experiencing uh, uh, actually a small uh, wave of the uh, uh, refugees who are coming uh, post-Taliban uh, taking power. This is the map that UNHCR updated on 20th of September, so a few days ago, indicating that close to 650,000 Afghans have been internally displaced. And uh, according to the UNHCR, close to 35,000 uh, crossed the border, uh, 20,000 came to Iran, uh, close to 11,000 to Pakistan and another 5,000 to Tajikistan. So this is the official figures that UNHCR uh, provided recently. According to the Iranian census, uh, in 2016, there were uh, 1.6 million other nationalities in Iran, uh, consisting of uh, Afghans, the majority of whom were Afghans, 96%. So, uh, and the estimate uh, uh, suggests that close to 2.3 million, uh, at least Afghans, are, Iran, are in Iran now. Uh, 700 and 80,000 are Amayesh car holder or considered as refugees. Uh, there are uh, 500,000 labor migrants and another uh, million, as it suggested, that they are undocumented. Um, the majority of Afghans in Iran are living in urban areas, 50% uh, of whom were born in Iran. So there are second and third generation Afghans who were born or raised in Iran. And Hazare and Tajik are the uh, main ethnic groups in Iran, followed by uh, Pashtun. This is the map that you are familiar with, that in 2015, there was a large wave of irregular migration from Afghanistan and Iran, among Afghans to Turkey, crossing the border to Greece and Europe, then Syrians and, and others from uh, Africa. And that was a time that, you know, the large wave came to uh, Europe. Uh, we were interested in uh, irregular migration among Afghans in Iran. We conducted a survey which was supported by uh, uh, the Department of Immigration and Border Protection in Australia uh, in collaboration with Australian National University. And when Mari was in charge of um, uh, that research department, uh, we collected data from 1,200 I mean, uh, of Afghans who were aged 18 to 44, and we asked them about irregular migration on several questions. This is one of the slides that I have from that survey, which is unpublished, uh, of course. Uh, we asked them how common is uh, how common illegal migration is among Afghans, and as you can see, 86% said very common. Um, and then we ask why legal migration is common. Uh, interestingly, close to 70% uh, said either because of the strict criteria, either or because they are not able to meet the conditions, or it is time or money consuming. And um, another, I mean, 18% uh, percent said uh, illegal migration is practical, feasible, and they have access to smugglers. And also we asked the most common destinations, uh, close to 50% said Europe, followed by Australia at that time, and then Turkey close to 12%, and then other countries. So that was interesting that first illegal migration is common among them, then they are considering Europe as the main uh, destination. After um, uh, that period, 2015 and 16, 
uh, two uh, major changes happened, uh, both in Iran and globally. Uh, in 2018, uh, the U.S. Um, sanctions uh, were imposed, and then waves of Afghan refugees began to return to the, to the uh, to Afghanistan due to the unfavorable economic conditions uh, in the host country. And then we experienced uh, coronavirus, and Afghans again fled to um, from Iran to Afghanistan, both because of the fear of the virus and then because of the lockdown that had put them out of work. Um, of course, Iranian government provided free COVID-19 treatment services and these two Afghans, regardless of their legal status, and this slowed down the return uh, trend uh, somehow. There are uh, many challenges for Afghans who are remaining in Iran. First, as I said, uh, many of them are undocumented, and this hinders their access to services. Uh, economic situation and the rise of unemployment and job losses uh, that affect both low and middle class natives and migrants. And at, at, at such times, usually governments um, take uh, nationals and natives as priority versus migrants. Uh, and there are, uh, of course, mobility restrictions due to the pandemic, and also uh, it is also um, due to the undocumented situation of many Afghans in Iran. Uh, while uh, the situation in uh, Iran, I explained for Afghans, the situation in Afghanistan is not favorable either. Uh, the enormous um, uh, influx of returnees who went back home were not able to settle or integrate into the whole society, to the home society, sorry. And with the withdrawal of U.S. Uh, military and financial support that was seized, um, have had uh, economic consequences for the country, and the economic situation post COVID-19 uh, may not be. Uh, recovering uh, very soon, and that has also implications for the countries um, uh, at large. Um, we know that uh, uh, in 15th of August, uh, Kabul uh, collapsed, and uh, the uh, U.S. Um, Army um, uh, withdrew on the 30th of August, um, 2021. And given the unfavorable economic uh, situation um, that Afghanistan uh, is facing, uh, we have another situation that U.S. freezed Afghan uh, assets, uh, and so the government is unable to recover very soon. That's one uh, major issue. Secondly, there is insecurity both perceived and in reality. People uh, feel uh, to be insecure, and also some of them are really experiencing that Taliban uh, going to their houses, searching for people who have been working for the government or for international agencies, etc. So insecurity is really felt there. There is a lack of social capital and trust among people and the government uh, because of the corruption that they faced. Uh, and there has been a long-standing standing, uh, ethnic composition and tension. And in addition to all these, the Taliban regime uh, uh, introduced an exclusive government and didn't invite other parties to the government. So that has um, added uh, sort of the uh, anxiety among uh, Afghans. Uh, Taliban came into the power, and on the other hand, you see uh, Afghans escaping the country packed in the U.S. military plane. That was an urgent and emergency uh, evacuation. I have a few other slides that have, and um, that uh, I'm going to talk about the implications for migration. Um, first, uh, there is uh, a large number of um, IDPs uh, that uh, they were internally displaced before uh, Taliban coming to power and then after the emergence of the um, uh, Taliban. There was a quick evacuation of many Afghans after Taliban taking power. We don't know where they've gone and uh, how and where they've been settled. And there are many who are coming to uh, the neighboring countries of Iran and Pakistan. And interestingly, when we uh, uh, are uh, searching who 
uh, are uh, the recently displaced Afghans, uh, uh, those who worked with international troops and agencies, those who worked with previous governments, and uh, uh, unfortunately, elite artists, university professors, army, skilled migrants, etc. So these are the um, uh, elite uh, sort of movement to other countries, and there are, of course, ethnic minorities. And the question is, what are the consequences of this elite or skilled migration from Afghanistan? There are irregular migration um, uh, to the neighboring countries, and it has implications uh, for uh, Afghanistan, Iran and Pakistan, Turkey and EU. From the observations that we have on the ground in Iran, uh, we uh, have been um, noting that uh, people in Afghanistan are really waiting to see at the moment to see what is happening. And the message is that if security, insecurity and discrimination and violence against other groups reduces and economic situation improves, then those in Afghanistan may stay and this prevent further displacement. So that's really a good message, but we have to see what happens next. For Iran and Pakistan, uh, given the experiences that they've had, they closed the border. Uh, there are restrictions to prevent large waves of uh, an influx of refugees. But uh, uh, at the same time, there are legal migration um, uh, that is uh, selective, and there are illegal and irregular migration to these two uh, destinations or host countries. And for the EU and Turkey, uh, we know that uh, several countries announced that they will be accepting a limited number of um, Afghans, and this will lead to a large number of asylum applications in the future. And uh, because of these, uh, this uh, tempt uh, some Afghans to move towards Turkey and then Europe uh, regularly. Now, there are two slides that I will be presenting. What needs to be done in the short term? Um, I think it is important uh, that uh, countries um, have flexible policies and plan to accommodate the recent wave of migrants and displaced population uh, who are in need um, and provide services, education, health, housing, uh, and even basic needs to the new arrivals. Uh, and real, uh, that is a real challenge. I've been meeting some of the new arrivals in Iran um, uh, recently, uh, and unfortunately, they have really uh, a very bad condition. They um, cross the border uh, in 20 or 23 days. They spent a lot of money um, and they gave money to smugglers. And now they are finding places. Uh, Iranians and Jews are helping them. Their network, um, they are helping them. But given that they are hidden, in the society, it is difficult to find them and provide services. So it's very important. You have to collect data and information and conduct surveys to measure the movement and understand the reasons and pathways and the situation of recently arrived migrants who are in need. And finally, um, what needs to be done in the mid and long term? Uh, I think uh, international response and collaboration with uh, Taliban regime is a, a real question. Um, uh, international uh, or governments should encourage um, a Taliban government for an inclusive government, bringing other parties uh, to uh, play um, and collaborate with the government. Uh, and then also there is issue of gender uh, and discrimination or discrimination that recently they announced that, for example, girls um, cannot go to school um, after uh, sixth grade. So this uh, is really a challenge for those who are remaining in Afghanistan. International support for peace building, uh, economic recovery and the construction of Afghanistan is one of the long-term plans that uh, both government in Afghanistan and other uh, governments uh, should help. Uh, services, education, health, welfare and employment is also a long-term plan, um, particularly uh, given the economic uh, unfavorable situation in Afghanistan. Uh, planning for management of IDPs, there are a large number of people who have been displaced. And as we know, the main uh, 
year of being displaced is uh, above 17 years or close to 20 years. So it's important um, for those who are displaced to provide services to them and, and help them to go back to their uh, places. And finally, uh, host countries uh, in neighbor, uh, Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, um, Tajikistan that are uh, 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 I mean, accepting these uh, large number of migrants should be supported uh, to facilitate uh, their integration to these societies and uh, hopefully in the future to return uh, to their countries. Um, and I'll leave you with this slide um, showing uh, promoting hope for Afghan migrants in Iran by a manager of Afghan school uh, in one of the uh, Tehran districts, um, that he's really a remarkable uh, person who has been helping Afghan migrants uh, and children to get education. That is really uh, a first priority for these uh, families who have come to Iran. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Abbasi Shavazi, for your very clear and instructive uh, presentation and clearly. I mean, implications uh, uh, regarding migration, displacement in Afghanistan are difficult to predict uh, as such, but this also, as you mentioned, really depends on the, on, on the conduct and behavior of the new regime. And then also uh, this depends on the reaction of neighboring countries and the international community uh, as a whole. Uh, as you rightly underline, uh, Iran is uh, uh, already today, before this crisis, uh, a major uh, a country of asylum uh, for Afghan citizens uh, since uh, decades. Uh, so already before uh, the fall of uh, the previous regime, uh, a very significant number of Afghan refugees were hosted in Iran, but also uh, migrant workers uh, from Afghanistan, as you, you mentioned. And I would add maybe uh, to, uh, to the picture of Pakistan, because uh, Pakistan too uh, uh, is hosting 1.4 million of uh, Afghan refugees, uh, even uh, uh, in December of last year. So, uh, which means that uh, Iran and Pakistan uh, uh, together uh, uh, are hosting 90% uh, of Afghan refugees in the world. So clearly, there is here uh, a, pre, uh, a predicted pressure on uh, neighboring countries and the international community and also uh, the West uh, must uh, uh, take its share in this uh, uh, situation and in uh, uh, also uh, giving protection to uh, Afghan refugees uh, 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 and uh, alongside their own uh, legal duties. I will now uh, uh, continue. Uh, we will continue the discussion with another uh, uh, expert, Dr. Uh, Mary uh, McAuliffe, uh, uh, who is head of uh, the Migration Research Division at IOM, and also, um, uh, among many other functions, senior uh, fellow at the Global Migration Center. And she has uh, uh, heavily uh, uh, work on uh, Afghanistan uh, uh, and all. Uh, it was also among many other uh, activities, uh, the topic of RPG studies. So I'm very pleased to welcome Mary uh, Matt Olive. Thank you very much indeed, Vincent, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about this, this highly uh, salient, very pressing um, international issue, uh, as well as a uh, pressing issue for the people of Afghanistan. Uh, wherever they may be. Um, I am about to share a presentation. Uh, I am another demographer, I'm afraid. So I will share the presentation and, and take you through a short um, sort of snippet. If there's only one thing that you remember from the presentation, what I would ask is that you think about uh, the gender implications of migration and displacement within Afghanistan and also from Afghanistan to other parts of the world. So that is the kind of like the key takeaway. It's often uh, forgotten. It um, raises its uh, very significant issues in the context of governance within Afghanistan, but it also comes up in the context of displacement and migration. 
four kind of key kind of areas. I will uh, move through this quickly. I'm very conscious of time and sticking to time. So we will go through Afghanistan in terms of migration displacement in a historical context. Uh, I think that understanding the present, we must look at uh, recent history. So looking back towards the 70s um, and uh, through to the current day. We have to also understand Afghanistan in a global context, and this is where I will draw on the work of the World Migration Report, several volumes, to look at Afghanistan and how it sits globally uh, in migration and displacement terms. And then the last key kind of issue is gendered uh, displacement and migration. And I know the uh, speakers following me, uh, Nassim Majidi and uh, Professor Alessandra Monsuti, have worked on this extensively and will add to it. I will just start the conversation. Here we can see the work of Susan Schmiedel, a fantastic Afghanistan scholar, and she has brought together uh, the various phases of displacement within and from Afghanistan since the 1970s. It's really a reminder of the modern day history of Afghanistan and the extensive insecurity and instability that the people of Afghanistan have faced over time. It really echoes uh, what um, Jalal was saying earlier in terms of the human security aspects that are challenging for near neighbours, challenging for the Afghan people and challenging for uh, many people, including the Afghan diaspora around the world. I've highlighted beyond uh, displacement that there are millions of Afghans living abroad. Of course, they are a heterogeneous uh, diaspora, like many diaspora. They do comprise refugees and non-refugees. And there are many countries of residence, including Iran, including Pakistan. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has a sizable population. Countries like Germany, the United States of America, the United Kingdom, Canada, and the Netherlands. Now, in terms of drawing on uh, the World Migration Reports to really understand uh, migration journeys from migrants' perspectives and how this is relevant to Afghanistan, I'm drawing on the 2018 volume here, the, the uh, photo of which for that particular chapter is an Afghan um, uh, asylum seeker who was in Indonesia at the time that photo was taken. Uh, but here we're talking about what people are facing when they are looking at survival migration, as Alex Betts, uh, Professor Alexander Betts from Oxford University would say through his work, looking at how they can consider um, survival strategies, livelihood strategies, uh, looking at international protection triggers and drivers, uh, social pressures, a whole range of different issues including the issue of visa access, which is central to how people consider the future of themselves, but also of their families and through intergenerational um, challenges related to uh, surviving in highly insecure situations. So here we bring together uh, correlations looking at the Human Development Index, Fragile States, the Henley Passport Index and the Global Peace Index all of which are highly relevant to Afghanistan. And as we go through and look at the lottery of birth, as we've called it in the chapter, we can see, for example, that right up the top there, Germany has very high human development. It's not a fragile country. It has low visa restrictions. And at that time in 2017, it was ranked first in uh, the passport index. Sri Lanka is mid-ranking, and we can see that it does have some uh, entry restrictions but it also uh, is able to, people with Sri Lankan passports are able to actually exercise a degree of freedom of choice in that respect. For Afghanistan, the situation is quite different. Low human development, extremely fragile, and very, very high uh, visa restrictions applying to people with Afghan passports. The current volume of the World Migration Report 2022, which we are working on forthcoming, we have a chapter that explores the links between conflict, uh, development and migration, sort of flips the, the drivers on their heads and really looking at peace and security as drivers of stability, development and safe migration. And here we can see 
using the Global Peace Index, the Fragility Index, Human Development, and also drawing on displacement data. That again, Afghanistan is right down the bottom of the table, low peace, extremely fragile, low human development. And Afghanistan currently ranks very, uh, very much at the bottom. It is the last country in the world on the passport index, meaning it is extremely difficult for um, people with Afghan passports to be able to access regular pathways, to be able to uh, get visas to travel. Here is the conundrum. I've drawn on the work, uh, but there are many, many, many scholars, um, many uh, think tanks, uh, many um, officials who work in this space. But I have drawn on the work of Jeff Crisp when he was at UNHCR highlighting this conundrum. And that is that a substantial proportion of people who access um, asylum processes are within the country in which they're seeking uh, international protection. Now, some may say that was in 1999 and it could be considered to be out of date, but more recent uh, work by the Migration Policy Institute when they were actually tracing the channels that refugees use to seek protection in Europe, a 2017 report, found that a similar dynamic uh, exists so that people who file an application for asylum often do so after they have actually entered the country through using non-humanitarian channels. So this herein lies a very, very significant conundrum for people in need of protection. In addition to understanding Afghan displacement and migration in terms of key issues such as drivers and triggers and geographic patterns, certainly volume and trends, uh, especially to support humanitarian assistance, human rights and protection, of course, and the risk of future and further displacement. We can also understand some of the dynamics in terms of the impacts on populations and especially groups of people who may be at heightened risk of extreme vulnerability. On the right hand side is an estimate that it draws on UN population data. It looks at the age and sex structure, a classic population uh, pyramid uh, for Afghanistan, uh, notwithstanding the challenges in understanding the, the actual demography of the Afghan population. And I'd like to just very quickly show you a few uh, population pyramids to highlight some of the challenges that we can see in regards to Afghan migration and displacement. The gender dimensions, uh, as you can see from these two graphs, are really profound. On the left hand side, we have Afghan resettled uh, refugees, and you can see that, that there is uh, broadly uh, parity in terms of sex disaggregation. The subpopulation that was able to be resettled, uh, who were able to take you know, safe journeys, who were able to travel without high degrees of risk to another country, uh, in order to receive international protection were very balanced. And obviously you can see there is quite a strong emphasis on young people there in terms of resettlement. On the right hand side, the graph is quite different. And this graph is of Afghan Hazara maritime asylum seekers uh, over five years. And you can see an extraordinary skewing of uh, sex and also age. It is consistent with the long-term research and analysis and data that is available on unaccompanied Afghan um, uh, asylum seekers, as we know, to Europe, that 15 to 19 age bar that you can see is very pronounced. Uh, uh, Professor Monsuti has done a lot of work in this particular area, and I'm sure he'll talk about it. But on the right, you can see extremely low female presence, very, very, very muted uh, presence of females traveling through that particular route uh, there. This is a particular issue for um, Afghan migration and displacement. It's echoed in other um, uh, analysis, demographic analysis of different subpopulations, such as Syrian refugees that have been resettled to Canada. Uh, you can see that on the left hand side. Again, uh, you can see broad sort of gender parity there, 
and young uh, children who were able to be resettled. On the right hand side, uh, this is the population uh, demographics of asylum seekers in Germany in 2015. It echoes um, the previous graph and you can see there's a significant spike there for 18 to 24 year old males. Um, but it is nowhere near the same uh, degree that we saw in terms of the sex disaggregation and a very significant skewing there. So what are the implications? The implications really go to five sort of key points. The relative power of passports is very much correlated to peace, to fragility and development. And we know that over a long period of time that passports of countries with low development, high fragility, low peace, have very limited or no access to visas and regular pathways. The conundrum is, however, that pathways to seeking protection are often linked to regular entry via visas. What does that mean? It leaves people in a highly vulnerable position. Uh, and that means that if you cannot access a regular pathway, irregular migration can be the only choice. We also know that irregular migration that is extremely high risk, such as maritime migration, is more likely to be highly gendered. And this is especially the case for some cultural and historical contexts. And lastly, this is the point that I would leave you with. If you can remember only one thing from this presentation, it is the gender implications, both to those people who are asylum seekers and seeking international protection and having to do so through a range of different migration options, but also for those who are left behind in highly precarious situations. Because as people move, as family members move uh, in need of international protection, families and family members and community members are often left behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mary uh, Macaulay, for your very uh, interesting and, uh, and evidence-based presentation. Uh, and the various index you presented are, are very helpful to provide a clear picture. And uh, following this st stands, uh, the probability of new displacement and migration is quite high. But uh, 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 as you rightly uh, mentioned, uh, uh, most asylum seekers are used to claim protection once they are already within the territory of the state. So clearly, from a, a more policy angle, uh, uh, following T's presentation, resettlement should be used uh, in a more uh, proactive way in the future in order to avoid uh, irregular uh, migration. I would like to, to continue uh, the discussion with uh, another uh, expert, uh, Dr. Nassim Majedi, who is the director of Samuel Hall and also research uh, associate at uh, Tuft uh, University. Please, uh, Nassim, you have, you have the floor. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, thank you to Abbas and Marie for setting the scene um, to what I will say now. I don't have a PowerPoint, so I hope you can just listen to me and follow me. Um, and here I'd like to talk about, I will cover four main implications of these recent events for future dynamics. But first, before talking about the future, I'd like to take you back a bit because we are, and there's a big lesson here, we are supposed to know what to do in situations like this of crisis. Um, and before even the Global Compact in 2012, so almost 10 years ago, the Islamic Republics of Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan, with the support of UNHCR, um, developed the solution strategy for Afghan refugees. Um, so before the Global Compact was signed, there was a multilateral regional agreement already in place with the same commitments to refugee protection and long-term solutions, to addressing the root causes of displacement, to equitable responsibility sharing, and to more development-oriented responses in line with national development policies. And it is also within this framework that we saw in Iran, Afghan refugees gaining access to education um, and more education rights at university levels. We also saw in Pakistan, 
um, in the last years, um, and Pakistan is not a signatory to the Refugee Convention, but we saw in Afghanistan refugees getting access to bank accounts for more economic inclusion. Those progresses were within these regional, this regional pact. But now that type of conversation seems to be very much one of the past, or at least restricted to the past migration and refugee flows. If you look at the language used now, there is no longer the same language or emphasis. We don't hear of asylum seekers or refugees being welcomed in Iran or Pakistan. We hear of new arrival of illegal migrants um, who might be granted temporary access to border camps. Um, so this is the main concern, that the attitude has shifted and that the migrants we're talking about now are not being treated in the same way or with the same rights as before, yet we know what the reality is for them. So there are three elements I will go over in my, in my 10 minutes. One is the lack of data, which prevents the kind of regional response or planning that we need to see. Second, the fact that most Afghans are trapped at home, and Marie explained it also very well, um, they're, and, and Nabas did too, they're unable to leave the borders, they don't have access to passports, we'll go over that. And third, uh, the response is an emergency temporary border response, far away from the development responses that are on the table. So on the lack of data first, in July 2021, UNHCR released figures on emergency preparedness in Iran. So thinking already, knowing already um, that parts of the Afghan territory were falling in Taliban hands. In July, the emergency response uh, figures indicated half a million new arrivals would be expected in the second half of 2021. In August, a month later, figures from UNHCR, UNHCR spoke of half a million refugees across the region. So all of a sudden, we're seeing that the numbers have, in effect, been shrinking. So instead of just half a million to one country, the estimates are half a million to the region. So why is it? Part of the issue is that the numbers aren't being properly documented or publicly shared, yet those numbers matter for planning, for monitoring, for responsibility sharing. So the numbers aren't clear, the sources, the counting systems, as much. We don't know how those numbers are being generated. Yet we know that the, that the evacuation photos that you saw from Kabul airport, we know the same level of crowds, of desperation, of thousands of people trying to get out. We know the same situation is now happening at the border points. So we know just from what we hear from people um, that there is the same chaos at border points at, as there is at Kabul airport, uh, as there was at Kabul airport in August. So there are more data to get from these areas, from the borders with Pakistan, with Iran. And there are more data to get on the profiles of women and children trying to cross those borders alone. Um, women who are speaking to me about spending weeks at the border alone before being able to cross over. Um, Hazara woman who I spoke to in Dasht Barchi in June, who had already been internally displaced 16 years ago because the Taliban had taken over their province in Wardak. Today, we're displaced because the Taliban took over Kabul and because of the fears uh, legitimate that Dashte Barchi residents have about their future. She explained to me that she had to spend 10 days at the border. Um, she doesn't have a passport. She doesn't have a visa. She managed to get through with a few others. And on the other side of the border, there was no refugee registration system. She wanted to claim asylum, but there is no longer any plans uh, approach to registering refugees in Pakistan. The few points of data that we are getting and that are very important to look at are, for example, UNDP's figures. Uh, UNDP released a report stating that there will be near universal poverty in the country in 2022. The estimates are 97 percent of the Afghan population will be under the poverty line in 2022. And then we know that millions will have no choice but to flee. So who will be reporting on the actual figures? Um, the first implication then of, of the recent events will be on the importance of data, monitoring and sharing information to plan, to know how many are leaving, to plan for them to be taken to safe places, and not just in the region, but looking beyond. There are global calls at the moment of mayors from Bristol, 
um, to Kampala, um, to Lille in France, mayors who are ready to welcome Afghan uh, asylum seekers and refugees. Um, but for that, we need them to have access to those countries. So that brings me to the second point, which is that today Afghans are unable to leave their country. They are being denied their universal human rights to exit their country. The borders are closed. Um, to facilitate reopening of these borders, there will be a need to negotiate with the Taliban. Governments are, are yet to do that. They're refusing to do that. But beyond that, Afghans have not had access to a passport service in a year. Most of 2021, uh, for most of 2021, the passport office or services in Afghanistan were closed because of the COVID pandemic. Today, they're closed because the Taliban have not reopened them, which means the majority of Afghans who had passports to be renewed couldn't renew them. Those who wanted to get legal identity couldn't access it. Beyond that, as Marie said, there's also the inability to get visas. Now that foreign governments have left, embassies have closed, to be able to get a visa, they have to be able to leave the country, which they can't, and ask and access uh, consulates abroad in Pakistan, India, or Iran. So there's an inability to get visas in Afghanistan or even less passes. So what women are telling me is that they're waiting. They're waiting for the passport office to open. The same queues you have seen in front of banks to withdraw money are the same queues we will see in front of passport offices to get their passport and to leave. Now, this brings us to the very important point of the evacuations that took place in August, and that ended on a calendar because a date had been set, but they didn't end because the conditions had been met. So evacuations must continue because that is the only hope of a safe exit for those who are at risk. Abbas spoke of the journalists, uh, the activists, and, and we know many more who are at risk, uh, and also all of those who don't have a legal documentation to leave. So the second implication is that we need to, to rethink what legal migration pathways might be. We need to think about what safe exits are, and evacuations have to be maintained as part of that regular pathway response. They worked in August, and we saw how much that mobilization saved lives. 128,000 people were evacuated, but there are many more left behind, and Afghans are waiting for that response to resume. Another key point um, is what Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and, and ourselves as Samuel Hall, we have been advocating for, is again, to go back to the text, to go back to the Geneva Convention. Uh, we know the answers are there. We know what to do. The refugee system and mandated actors like UNHCR can facilitate refugee status recognition if they provide a group-based recognition to Afghans today. So prima facie refugee recognition. Um, Amnesty called for this recognition specifically for women and girls because they are specifically in danger. Uh, we are calling for it for, for other groups as well who are being persecuted uh, for belonging to specific ethnic groups. Um, and again, the gender component, as we said. So the third implication is that Afghans should have um, prima facie refugee status, be given that recognition to facilitate, again, all of the administrative hurdles that are in front of them to give them, um, to give them that recognition um, and the right to protection abroad. And finally, I will close on what more can be done and a further implication. So the question is, will governments stick to border and temporary responses? Because today, Pakistan, for instance, is keeping a buffer area at the border for Afghans who are arriving. So they can't leave border camps. Will we just stick to that or will there be a regional uh, effort by governments to open up for example, to the solution strategy again, or to open up to Europe's uh, regional development and protection response offers. And so here we have to remember again what region we're talking about. And this region has been hit economically, politically. Iran's population, so whether Iranians or Afghan refugees living there, have suffered dramatically under the US sanc sanctions. And that needs to be a very clear advocacy area for European countries, for the international community. If we want to see a regional response to Afghan migration, we will also need to see the end of sanctions, for example, on Iran. Again, let's remember that 
if the population of Afghanistan was around 20 million during the last Afghan refugee crisis, today the pop population is closer to 40 million. So Iran and Pakistan will be under a much bigger strain because of this demographic shift and also because of the economic and political strains. So any strategy, any regional strategy for this Afghan refugee response has to take into consideration um, a, a U.S. lifting of sanctions. And again, just finishing on this note, um, the issues in this region, again, are, are bigger, bigger than just Afghanistan. They're also about, obviously, Pakistan's involvement, about the sanctions against Iran, uh, and about what the U.S. is ready to do. Um, it won't be as easy rolling out a refugee uh, regional funding window in this region as it has been, for example, in the Middle East or in East Africa, as there are underlying issues to be treated. So it brings us back in the end, it circles us back to the role that the U.S. played in this crisis and the role that it will be ready or not to play in unlocking solutions um, for uh, a proper protection response and a proper regional response. And I know and I hope um, that Alessandro will touch on, on the role of the U.S. Uh, in this region as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nassim uh, Majidi, for your very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, presentation. And, and as you uh, perfectly uh, mentioned, uh, we, 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 uh, unfortunately, this is not the first uh, crisis, and we know what to do. We have the tools to address issues. And uh, clearly, the very uh, typical first step uh, uh, used all in many other regions is uh, prima facie refugee recognition, first of all, in neighboring countries. But of course, this is not, uh, I mean, this is only a first step uh, uh, in the sense that these Prima, uh, prima facie recognition must be combined with uh, a quite significant support, uh, material, financial, to Iran, Pakistan, and other uh, uh, neighboring countries. And also, uh, again, uh, combined with resettlement and uh, lawful avenues for our refugees uh, and, and migrants from uh, Afghanistan, because uh, this is a truly collective responsibility. Uh, this is not only a regional one, uh, the international community has a role to play, and especially the West, uh, also Western states, the US, uh, European states, uh, given their quite heavy responsibility in the current situation also. So clearly, uh, we have the tools to address this situation, uh, and we know how to do, but of course, this really depends on, uh, uh, at the end, on the political will to address uh, uh, these uh, issues. Uh, I'm pleased now to, to continue the discussion uh, and to give the floor to Alessandro Mansouti, who is a professor uh, at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, and also an uh, 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 eminent member of the Global Migration Center, and uh, 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 an expert uh, uh, in the, uh, of Afghanistan, and in particular, on, uh, uh, Afghan refugees. Please, uh, you have the last uh, words uh, uh, before we will continue the discussion with, uh, with the Q&A uh, session. Thank you so much. So the last words, probably not, but uh, I will do my best to uh, bring some, some new insights on the discussion, which has been already very rich. And maybe I will take a step away from migration issues per se. Uh, my question, uh, a question I ask to myself every day, is which kind of uh, moment do we live now in Afghan history, but also I would say uh, about uh, global history. So uh, to put it differently, what the situation in Afghanistan and the recent events are telling us about uh, the way the world is governed and uh, which kind of learning we can have from what happened. How can we explain and make sense that just in a few weeks or months, the Taliban have been able to wipe out 20 years of reconstruction effort? Just a few facts and figures. 20 years, $2 trillion spent by the U.S. Treasury, which means two with 12 zeros after two, and uh, an effort which has been, you know, implemented through democracy uh, building, the election of governments, a parliament, 
uh, women's empowerment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, how is it possible that so quickly all these effort has been destroyed, in a sense? Uh, it's very difficult to uh, to make sense of that, and I think it's a very painful moment for uh, most Afghans and most people who have loved Afghanistan and have lo and and love Afghans. Uh, but my my take is that uh, we are facing a kind of failed hegemony in the sense that probably um, the international community has failed to convince large segments of the Afghan population that the model of the state and society they were promoting in Afghanistan was the best one. So it's very difficult for a Democrat like me to accept it. But uh, uh, I think we should really... Um, uh, try to understand in a neutral way and probably putting into bracket our own values. So for me, the model of the state and society which has been promoted by the US and the UN has indeed failed to convince some large segments of the population. I don't understand, I don't know how we can explain what was going on if we don't take this, this kind of hypothesis, if, as unpleasant it might be. Uh, in a sense, the Taliban, we can see how they behave and what they are doing. They are probably quite similar to the Taliban they were 25 years ago. Ideologically, there is no reason to think that they are very different. They have learned policy and politics. Very savvily, I would say. Uh, we can see how they behave during the, the peace talks in Doha, how they, in a sense, uh, made their points to the U.S. administration, but also how they were able to uh, to uh, to manipulate, in a sense, the Afghan government. So uh, if I think that the Taliban are ideologically not very different from the past, they are more savvy politically. That's probably our only hope. And I think uh, Jalal was concluding his intervention in saying that we have to get into the arena and, in a sense, negotiate with the Taliban, convince them to be recognized they need to stick to some principles of recognition of minorities, women, etc., etc. So we have to bet, in a sense, on their pragmatism. That's not very um, reassuring, but that's the only uh, avenue we probably have. So, but let me give some elements of context, uh, referring to the, the costs of war, a project run, uh, hosted at the Watson Institute in the United States. So between 2001 and 2021, about 241,000 people have been killed in the Afghanistan-Pakistan war zone. That's quite a lot, almost 250 million, uh, 15,000, sorry. Uh, more than 71, thousand civilians have been killed in Afghanistan alone. That's quite massive as a number. Let's compare the, the death toll. Uh, the US military, they have lost less than 2,500 combatants, while the, the opposition fighters, the Taliban and other groups, have lost more than 50,000 people. Uh, so to tell it like that, uh, for one US combatant who was killed, you had uh, 20 Taliban who were killed. So the, uh, uh, the counterinsurgency in Afghanistan has been extremely brutal, and that's something we have to keep in mind. So bombardments, drones, they have killed a lot of people. Uh, very often uh, they made mistakes, they even bombard weddings. So we have to really take into, uh, into acknowledgement how repressive was the military presence of the foreign troops in Afghanistan, especially for the rural population. Still, uh, the costs of war, they uh, mentioned that in 2017, the US military relaxed its rules of engagement for airstrikes in Afghanistan. And uh, since 2017, you had an increase of civilians' casualties by 330%. So just to, to give you an idea of the trend, so not only uh, the military action of the U.S. in, the, in Afghanistan was extremely uh, deadly, but it was increasingly deadly even when the ground troops were not active anymore uh, since 2000, 2014. So that's something we have to uh, once again uh, uh, strongly, I would say, uh, recall. Uh, and that's probably 
uh, why the Taliban they have also been able to capitalize on a kind of uh, fatigue in front of uh, what the government was doing to its population with the support of its uh, somehow you know foreign uh, godfathers. So uh, we have to denounce human rights abuses of by the Taliban. Uh, they are persecuting people. We know that they are conducting extrajudicial executions. But we have to be balanced and also recognize what the government has done before and what its, uh, once again, its supports from inter the international community was doing. So, in, indeed, uh, for rural populations, the uh, counterinsurgency has been extremely heavy. And uh, we know that the CIA has backed uh, uh, Afghan militias who were also conducting extrajudicial executions. And that's all this context we have to remember when we look at what is going on now. Uh, if we do, so I think it's a duty, it's a moral and political duty to have a balanced view on what has happened in the past and what is happening in the present. It's absolutely not about excusing anything, but it's about having a kind of encompassing uh, vision on Afghanistan past, present, and probably also to imagine what can be the future. This, at the same time, I think uh, I was talking about the rural population. We have seen in the last few weeks that the focus of international med media was indeed on Kabul. And I think uh, Jalal, Mari, and uh, uh, Nassim, they all repeated and mentioned the difference between uh, the, the, the present and the past and the fact that today uh, land border crossing is extremely difficult uh, uh, in contrast to what it was in the 80s, 90s and uh, even in the, the more recent past. For Afghans, mobility has been always an option out of violence and it was highly organized and it was not so difficult somehow to go to Pakistan and even in Iran from Afghanistan. Now it's increasingly difficult. And you have this kind of reversal. Uh, the, the evacuation we have talked about uh, in, the, in the second half of August, 120,000 people, is very new. It's the first air evacuation, mig massive migration in Afghanistan. But it's only the second time, in a sense, that Afghanistan is losing parts of its uh, urban population of skilled people. It happened the first time after 1992 with the, the, the fall of, the, the, of Kabul in the hands of the different resistant factions who started an internal war and destroyed Kabul. And in the, the years after 1992, you had already, I would say, part of the urban population which left Afghanistan and went first maybe in Pakistan, India, and then Australia and elsewhere. So in a sense, what uh, is uh, happening now is totally novel and not so novel on some other aspects. So it's partly a repetition of what happened in 92 and the following years, partly, but it's also very new on some aspects. At the same time, I have the feeling, I was always very uneasy with these scenes of the Kabul airport, because once again, and Nassim said it, uh, we didn't focus equally on the land border crossing posts. And in a sense, we are reproducing a kind of uh, perspective which is inherently unequal on the Afghan population. Somehow, who is the sovereign here? The sovereign in the philosophical sense of uh, Karl Schmitt, uh, Michel Foucault, or George Agamben. Who is deciding about who is, deserves merit to be saved? So uh, now we can see an inequality between the urban and the rural population, which has been, I think, also recognized and uh, mentioned by my colleagues before, before me. So uh, in a sense, it's extremely difficult for uh, the rural population now to have access to any form of protection. And uh, it's also very paradoxical, and that's totally novel for Afghanistan, that you have people, I know some people who are resident in the UK or elsewhere in Europe and were are just visiting their family in Kabul. So they could really go back to the UK or other European countries, but they are trapped inside Afghanistan. They cannot live. And that's also something which was quite different in the past.
So we can see uh, the situation is, 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 is extremely painful. We know that. For me, it's extremely important to look at the long durée of the political history of Afghanistan and to, in spite of everything, correlate the success of the Taliban with the failure of the reconstruction. And uh, we should not totally deny the possibility that uh, for some parts of the Afghan population, the victory of the Taliban has uh, improved their everyday life. Uh, the rural population of the south and the east have not been bombarded since the Taliban are around. And uh, so it's extremely difficult to assess, I think, what has been done and what is going on now if we don't just look at Kabul. So uh, um, uh, what is worrying me in terms, now I'm going more to, towards migration issues. Uh, when I was doing my field work as an anthropologist uh, in the past, I was very struck by the fact that uh, the main strategy of more than survival, I would say, but response to violence by, developed by Afghans was uh, uh, two folds was about ongoing circulation. They were circulating between Afghanistan, Iran, and uh, Pakistan and beyond, but also the dispersion of the domestic units. So different uh, brothers were going to different uh, locations, destinations, in order to spread the risk. I said brother because it has been said uh, by Marie in particular, uh, we are in front of an extremely gendered um, uh, kind of migration. Uh, the first one to move are uh, young men. So uh, that's the three uh, features of Afghan migration in the past, I would say. An ongoing circulation, mobility between different countries, a dispersion of the domestic unit, and a super-gendered kind of mobility. Uh, this uh, survival strategy, which was developed in the past and has proven its efficiency, is probably not available anymore to Afghans now because they cannot cross land uh, border uh, posts like they do, they did in the past. And that's for me a very uh, strong source of concern. In a sense, they are prevented to keep the kind of strategies they had in the past. And I don't know if international protection could, in a sense, fill the gap. It has not done in the past, and uh, I don't know how just, you know, mobilizing, uh, Solidarity internationally can compensate the strategies developed by Afghans themselves. So it's very important to imagine that they can still move around uh, on the land. And uh, uh, that's really for me a very, very important source of uh, concern. Uh, I would like maybe to mention at the end, okay, I think my time is over. So, uh, um, in the last years, Afghans were indeed less and less welcomed in Pakistan and Iran. We know that, it has been said, and they were increasingly obliged to or pushed to look at uh, more distant destinations from Australia and particularly uh, Western Europe. But these destinations were really risky and uh, they had to, to explore increasingly risky routes and uh, it's very difficult to know the condition of uh, asylum they will get in uh, Western countries today. So are we, uh, should we expect a new massive migration of Afghans outside Afghanistan or not? I myself, I'm really, I don't know. I have absolutely no clue. I think there are good reasons to see that we can expect that. But at the same time, we can also, uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, the obstacles they have, they are facing on the route is much more, uh, it's much higher than probably in the 80s and 90s. So uh, we have good reasons to be, to be worried, let's say like that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Alison Amonsuti, for your very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, it is uh, a moral and political political duty to have a balanced view uh, about the situation, uh, but it's not, it is, must not be an excuse for any actors involved. Uh, clearly, as the international community must uh, learn from its uh, own mistakes uh, in its failed uh, attempt to uh, 
uh, of peace building, but also we should also acknowledge that uh, the new regime uh, uh, is uh, maybe also, uh, I mean, uh, a source, uh, a major source of difficulties and abuses for uh, the Afghan population. And clearly, uh, uh, the difficulty uh, here you identify is the fact that contrary to the past, mobility can be more uh, restricted than uh, uh, previously. And here is the key, uh, uh, the main uh, source of concern because uh, clearly uh, the risk, as you rightly mentioned, is uh, an increase of uh, irregular migration through uh, a very risky journey. And uh, from this angle, uh, there are not so many uh, uh, ways to avoid this. At some point, uh, I mean, uh, not only regional responsibility, but also the responsibility, again, of, uh, of uh, the US, uh, European states, and many others, because after all, they have, first of all, a legal duty to protect refugees, but they, are, they also have, a, 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 this is also a moral a duty, uh, simply because they, they, they were involved in uh, the uh, invasion and military occupation of, of the country. So they are partially responsible for the current uh, chaos and, and uh, blatant uh, failure in uh, uh, establishing a truly uh, a democratic state. So uh, at some point, uh, there is more than ever a need for a truly uh, collective uh, uh, action in order to um, save. Uh, so we need to be saved and also to help uh, Afghanistan uh, uh, in uh, 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 establishing uh, uh, peace, security, and, and, and stability. 